For the last many years, I've been looking at the potential of artificial intelligence to change the field of battle. And applications of AI in warfare bring to mind these disastrous outcomes and you know crazy AI weapons running amok. But really, it's very important to grapple with the implications of artificial intelligence being used for warfare. Inevitably, they will be. And any technology that man discovers, essentially humankind looks to apply that technology to warfare. It is in the nature of man to seek that competitive benefit, to seek that competitive gain in confrontations. It's very, very hard to change that human nature. And in many ways, there's a game theoretic approach at work. If I don't use AI to make better weapons or to make smarter weapons than my opponent will, and in the case of AI, really we're talking about software. We're talking about unverifiable technology. It's not the kind of thing that you can fly a U-2 or a satellite or a spy plane over and detect whether a country, let's say, is building a nuclear reactor. If uh, somebody's made a breakthrough in, in artificial intelligence, it might be on, stored on some kind of a solid state disk in a lab somewhere. It's very hard to verify what level of capability exists. So when there's this imperfect information about what your opponents, what your competitors might have, it's only natural to assume that they have a lot. And therefore, you tend to develop these technologies too, because not developing them would create an existential problem, would create a problem whereby you might potentially lose in a conflict. And no nation, no society, no group of people will uh, allow somebody else to get that kind of an overwhelming advantage over them. So there's this game theoretic uh, view that propels the use of artificial intelligence in warfare forward. So now the question is, do you ignore it, do you simply condemn it, or do you try and understand it, do you try to project where this might be going, and do you try and guard against it, at least as far as the use of AI against your own um, country or your own interests is concerned? And I've opted to take the latter view, which is, let's try and understand it, let's try and engage with people that build, uh, design these policies, and let's try and figure out how artificial intelligence can be applied in relatively safe ways in this field of endeavor. So in that spirit, uh, for the last many years, I've worked with General John Allen, Secretary Bob Work, and many others to figure out how the intersection of military theory and strategy uh, intersects with and how it affects uh, artificial intelligence applications and how it uh, affects the future of war. What you're seeing now in Nagorno-Karabakh, for example, from the last couple of years, or what you're seeing um, in the very unfortunate war that's going on in, in Ukraine, is the application of autonomy and the application of inexpensive systems like drones. Uh, equipped with cheap cameras and equipped with really rudimentary AI type, machine vision type algorithms that are used, for example, to detect a tank. And in the case of loitering munition, go and take that tank out. This is already creating a disruption on the battlefield because essentially you are equipping an individual with, um, let's say, a UAV that can loiter for hours, can look for a tank or can look for an armored vehicle or lo look for a howitzer or any kind of a cannon and then go and take it out. Now, this capability is extremely rudimentary when it comes to what artificial intelligence will eventually do. And while most people focus on artificial intelligence and warfare in the area of kinetic effects, in other words, in terms of what it will do with weapon systems, of which loitering munitions are one example, where artificial intelligence can be extremely powerful is in some other areas. So I'll talk about those as well. Now, in the area of kinetic effects, of course, you've also, you may have heard, of AI pilots being able to take control of aircraft, fighter aircraft, and essentially carry out entire missions. Now, initially, you might think of this as an AI pilot might be better than a human, right? And you might evaluate this change, this, um, this uh, injection of AI into a combat aircraft 
on that vector, that it's just better. But that's not the only vector in terms of skill. Really what's happening is that an Air Force, a professional Air Force, has to get uh, 200, 200 plus hours every year for every pilot in order to get them to train effectively and in order for them to be effective in the field of battle. When you bring AI into an aircraft, essentially what you're saying is it's not just about that particular mission, but the years that led up to the mission that have been simplified. There is no need for 250 hours of training, an incredibly expensive endeavor per pilot. I mean, for example, some of the aircraft in the US Air Force uh, cost dozens of thousands of dollars, you know, in the mid 20s, 30, 40,000 dollars an hour to fly. So you're talking about millions of dollars per pilot per year in just training costs that AI just eliminated. Now that money can be applied elsewhere and where it can be applied is affecting what's called the teeth to tail ratio. In other words, the logistics, training, all the other non-kinetic things that a, a, a military needs to do in order to do its job on the battlefield. That would be the tail, the enablers. And then the teeth are, of course, the connective, uh, kinetic effects, the being able to deliver power, being able to deliver um, you know, an attack against a target, being able to prosecute those types of actions. And in general, you know, the, the tail is really much longer and, uh, and more voluminous than teeth have ever been in a military. And with AI, it's not just, again, about the machine being controlled by an autonomous piece of software. It's about that entire ratio in militaries being varied. And a military that effectively surpasses others in that teeth to tail ratio will have a tremendous advantage over any other military. Even if, uh, let's say, an individual human pilot can best an individual AI pilot in a certain scenario, overall, the benefits will far outweigh uh, the drawbacks. So again, goes back to that game theoretic point, this is something that just has to happen. The technology is there and it will happen. Other examples of where AI is being applied are just in logistics and maintenance. You know, the training of a pilot, uh, a similar metric applies to the upkeep of equipment. It's really, really expensive to keep up with expensive, heavy equipment that consumes a lot of spare parts, that consumes a lot of fuel. Part of that, of course, is wear and tear during training, which AI might minimize by essentially doing autonomous piloting or autonomous control of these systems. But the other elements are just keeping machinery going, uh, even when they're not training. It's expensive to do. So with predictive maintenance systems where artificial intelligence can read data from a variety of sensors, from a variety of logbooks, maintenance guides, and then be able to uh, project what the best maintenance actions for a piece of equipment might be, these types of things have the potential of saving professional militaries billions of dollars on an annualized basis. And again, that's all money that either goes back to the development of a nation or is reinvested in areas where the um, you know, war fighting capability of a military is enhanced. It's money that can be well repurposed. A third area which I think has transformative potential is command and control. Now, if you think about command and control, there are two elements. One is being able to sense, being able to know what's happening in the battlefield. And for this, an array of sensors is deployed. A satellite is a sensor. A sonar buoy is a sensor. Uh, you know, eyes on the field are a sensor. So the first thing that you have to do is get all of this information back to a commander. You have to create what's called a common operating picture a picture that is shared by actors in the battlefield that are on the same side that shows them how to operate in this complex battlefield where a lot of things are moving. Your own stuff is moving, the enemy is moving, and so on and so forth. So being able to synthesize a common operating picture across hundreds, thousands of sensors is a capability unique to AI. And when I talk about synthesis, I'm not just talking about layering the information one atop the other 
here's the picture from the radar, here's a picture from sonar, here's a visual picture, but rather being able to prioritize, being able to filter out that which is not important, being able to predict where a certain trend might go in the next 5, 10, 15 minutes. And those are capabilities that, again, requires presence of mind, requires quickness of action, requires the ability to integrate information from a huge amount of, of sensors. And this is a capability that's going to be unique to artificial intelligence. No human can provide the integration of that capability. No single human mind is large enough to do that. So when it comes to creating these pictures and integrating sensor information, AI is going to be an incredibly important factor. Another thing that AI is doing, which you might consider more tactical, but it's related to sensors, is where it can fuse multiple sensors of the same type or sensors that reinforce each other, such as, for example, radar and, let's say, infrared, and being able to create more accurate readings, more accurate detections by fusing this data together. And that means that you're essentially upgrading the hardware without touching the hardware. You're upgrading the hardware by replicating the same low-level, low-quality hardware and allowing AI to synthesize multiple readings, or you're taking two inexpensive sensors but creating from them a picture that only a very expensive sensor could have given you. And this also is a massive capability in terms of creating that common operating picture. Now, the other element of this is once you know, then you have to act. And of course, that action requires uh, communication and it requires coordination. Now, communication is something that is already really important on the battlefield and it already is an area of huge investment and it's a topic for another day for example quantum communication which uh, if it's interfered with you immediately know that uh, somebody listened in along the way which is a property that no other communication medium has provided so far so there's a lot of innovation happening in that area but beyond that there's also the acting and the coordination with artificial intelligence, particularly multiple autonomous actors on the battlefield, you can create coordination of action that essentially outweighs and outdoes anything that's been possible so far. Why is that important? Because one of the principal, um, uh, you know, one of the principles of, of war is to concentrate power in a particular area, apply as much power, as much force as you can to an area of the enemy's weakness and to break through. You might have an overall force that is smaller than the enemy's, but if you can coordinate and perfectly apply a relative power advantage in a particular area, then you can undo your enemy. So coordination is something that's in incredibly important in order to create that kind of uh, power balance in a microcosm on the battlefield. And being able to pivot from one to another to a third, that capability of coordinating at a place and a time, and then knowing where to pivot and to optimize logistical action, to optimize economy of movement, to be able to conserve the uh, kinetic effects, the ammunition necessary to create good outcomes, not just in the first application of, of force, but in the coordinated applications of force, let's say that are, uh, you know, three deep or four deep. You apply force at point A, then pivot to B, then pivot to C. Being able to optimize across that entire campaign that's something that uh, artificial intelligence and planning systems that use AI can begin to deliver. So while there's a lot more that's happening with AI in the battlefield and uh, almost every day you see some new system, some new kind of drone, some new kind of autonomous capability, I think that what you're seeing now is just the tip of the iceberg. I think that applications of AI will change teeth to tail ratios, they will create this kind of perfect coordination. They will create optimization across multiple actions on the battlefield. They will create pictures for commanders that have never been created before. And they'll create the ability to collapse the OODA loop, the observe, orient, decide, act loop. The actions that need to occur in order for 
you know, a, a, a detection via a sensor to be converted to an action, ultimately a target that's acted upon or an enemy that's acted upon. Shrinking that OODA loop, being able to move faster than your opponent, being able to have a force that has a greater uh, you know, set of teeth compared to the size of its tail uh, when you contrast it with the enemy's force, these are things that have deep, deep implications for the future. The um, uh, you know, necessity or the, the elimination of the training advantage has a deep implication for the future. And these are trends in AI, uh, particularly when it's applied to warfare, that you'll start to see in the years ahead.